Role-playing games are very popular in Japan. So when Sony Corporation planned to introduce its PlayStation console, they decided to offer a spectacular RPG to show off the new platform's capabilities. That was the beginning of the saga that is Ark the Land. The Ark the Lad series was produced in Japan by Sony's Ark Entertainment subsidiary. I personally think that the base of RPG game elements are story, characters, and how well they are crafted and how interesting they are. So we need to make sure that those things are done right, otherwise even if the hardware improves, the game itself might not improve drastically. Nakagawa-san is the producer of Ark the Lad, he's involved with all the games, sort of oversaw them all, and he was sort of involved with the initial ambitious idea that they would create this flagship RPG for their new gaming platform. I have studied a lot of pre-existing RPG games, and after I studied these existing RPGs, we still wanted something different from the RPG format, for which we had a lot of ideas. Of course, right now, it is considered normal to do so, but at that time, we wanted to include CG movie segments, and for the first time, use voice effects when the characters were involved in fight scenes. This was also the first attempt to link the saved data from Game 1 to Game 2. I believe we had such a deep treasure of ideas. At first, Ark was intended to be a single game. But in 1995, with the deadline for release looming and so much work left to do, it was decided to break the ambitious project in two. Due to the fact that it was released as two games, we made the end of Ark 1 in such a fashion to be continued which generated a lot of talk by people. When Ark the Lad was made available, first we saw the screenshots. To tell you the truth, at that time, I wasn't that surprised. However, when we actually played the games, we were very surprised. It was a very high quality presentation, and the sounds and the characters' actual speaking and that kind of thing was placed all throughout the game. This kind of RPG never existed in a platform before the introduction of the PlayStation hardware. On the battle maps, most of the characters have six or eight frames of animation detailing what they do, which allows the character to be more expressive, whereas most games usually use two or three frames uh, for each character. Ark the Lad 2 was released with great success in November of 1996. Fans could now take advantage of the PlayStation's unique memory system. The memory system is really cool because you can bring saves from Arc 1 forward to Arc 2 and then Arc 2 saves to Arc 3. And the benefit of doing that is you get uh, events that you wouldn't get if you just played Arc 2 without playing Arc 1. By bringing your saves forward you get hidden events, secret items, and the biggest benefit of that is primarily in Arc 2 because you get this whole event with Choco. The memory system also allowed Sony to create a new related game, Arc Monster Tournament which has been renamed Ark Arena for its U.S. release. And what you could do is take the monsters that you could capture in the game and fight against another player. And you can fight for their monsters or you can fight for items that they have. Ark Monster Tournament was a sensation and two national championships were organized. Hello. This was a big success and the Pokemon people did the same thing. I believe that Ark the Lad is the only game that can be used in this kind of way in the PlayStation format. If the same kind of thing becomes popular in America, we would be very happy. If we could let the champion American monster fight against the champion Japanese monster, it might yield an interesting result. I don't know if this is possible or not, but I think it would be very interesting. Ark 1 is a game that people can complete in about 10 hours if they are playing at an average rate. I think most people who played Ark 1 successfully reached the end of the game, and I believe this game created a trend for more user-friendly RPG games. For the maniac-type hardcore gamers who purchased their first PlayStation and played Ark 1, they sometimes criticized or complained because they could only get about 10 hours of play out of it. 
Since we created this game with pride and confidence, we never regretted making it. However, this criticism caused our creative spirit some concern. Therefore, we decided to make a game that had a wide application that anyone could play, but that could be utilized for up to 50 hours. That was the ARC 2 game. ARC the Lad became a phenomenon in Japan. Fans created ARC websites. Magazines, trading cards, calendars, postcards, and other items sold like hotcakes. So Sony decided to continue the series, releasing ARC 3 in 1999. I heard from Mr. Akagawa that they were not originally planning on making ARC the Lad 3. Arc the Lad 2 was considered to be the final segment in the game series. However, the fans started to express their desire to make a sequel. So that is how they decided to make Arc the Lad 3. This is a long story written in three parts. All three series have different main characters. Each main character has their own unique personality. The story is kind of dark. However, each of these main characters opposes the bad forces. I found it interesting the way the main characters fight against the evil forces, the way they fight and stand up for justice, even when these characters were in desperate circumstances. The original Ark the Lad scenario was created by myself and an editor friend whom I consulted at the beginning, and a person from the company called G-Craft. We were involved in creating the game at the beginning. The first story is told from the perspective of Ark and Kukuru, who are both destined to save the world according to legend, but they don't know it. Then at the end of one, the story changes perspective, which is sort of unique and really cool. Because the story is connected from one to two, if a character who was a hero in one comes out again as a hero, then it isn't very interesting as a story. That's what I thought. When we show that different angle of the story, then the story will have more contrast. That is the sort of effect we try to achieve. I think it was a good idea. Arc 1 advances with the main story alone. It is not a very long game. From Arc 2, the style changes a little bit. And besides the main story, there is also a sub-story called Guild Work. For Arc 3, we put that Guild Work, which was the subsystem in Arc 2, as the main storyline in Arc 3. By accepting the Guild Work, it causes the main story to develop. It's so complex. There are so many things to do, so many extra things, so many side quests or jobs to take on that um, just playing through the storyline, you'd be missing half the game. In Arc 3, there is a place in the sub-scenario where you have to clear certain events in order for the heroine to become your partner. There are also some events you cannot see unless you fail at that juncture. Sometimes by failing, you can see more interesting or funny events as a consequence. So in that sense, there are some hidden avenues in the game. Love, hate, good, evil, death, um, life, rebirth, destruction. I mean, all the major themes are touched on and in a much more serious and realistic way than most or all RPGs that have come before for console systems. I really like the beginning of ARC 2 when you see it pan over and everybody gets shot. That was just really cool. They all just fall down, blood coming out. I totally didn't expect that in an RPG. A lot of death, a lot of blood, a lot of people getting crushed. I like the one scene where the guy gets slammed against the wall and turns into a slime. That was really cool. Yeah, I like gruesome things. With this game, you really get involved with all the characters. There are so many characters in the game. I try to make the characters as lovable characters. It's not like we love only one main character exclusively, but each different character will be loved. Most of them have um, been wronged by the Dark Force and they have to, uh, you know, they're joining the group to save the world and, and uh, you know, get a little revenge in between. Ark in the whole series is driven by the loss of his father. And he doesn't know a lot about his dad, but the blizzard that his dad predicted comes true 10 years later and Ark grabs a sword and heads up to the mountain to find out what happened to his dad. And that runs through the whole story until he finds out what happened to his dad. 
Kukuru's um, motivation is she's a descendant of the Sacred Clan, the Clan of White. She has to stay as a member of her clan and hold this, this seal that's holding this darkness, this evil, in place as long as she can until Ark gets back to stop it. There is a character called Tosh that we had certain grand ambitions for. I believe that popular supporting characters in RPG have certain specific features and types that become popular. I don't know what the proper phrase in English would be, but the character with certain problems, the dirty hero, but in the end he gravitates to the side of justice. This is the type of character that I very much wanted to create. Gogan is very old. Uh, more than 3,000 years. He was one of the original Brave Seven that stopped the advance of evil or darkness the time before. As Ark, when you start your quest, you go in and, and get Gogan because he's going to be your guide to find the five stones you need to unseal the Ark and help save the world. Characters like Chongara have never existed in any RPG game before. The person who had worked on creating the characters for this game at the beginning of the project had a body that looks just like Chongara. So we basically used him as a model. So henceforth, this character became a rather memorable character for me. Just like with Ark, Elk is also driven because, you know, when Elk is a child, he sees his family uh, killed, his whole tribe killed, as a matter of fact. But he's driven by hate and the need for revenge. But that turns into something else as the story progresses, which is another one of the underlying themes is that hate never produces anything but hate. Well, I like Deepak the best. Um, he's a robot. You get him in Vilmer's lab, each power unit you attach to him gives him more abilities. So you then take him back to the lab, put him on a pedestal, and you can give his experience to any other character. And power of characters are really high just by, you know, leeching off Deepak's experience. Because he can't use it himself because he's not a human. Alec is a very straightforward, kind, and courageous type character. And that is the traditional boy's heroic type character. The character Lutz was a secondary comic and energetic character. Those two characters in combination existed before I started working on the project. So for those two characters, I tried to extend and enhance their character without altering their basic characteristics. Everybody has a little bit of pain in the game. They all have some sort of personal tragedy and they all band together to rise above that. When I come up with the character ideas, rather than using good aspects of characters, the shortcomings of the characters are more important. I think these faults of character are more interesting. For example, Lutz is clownish, and that is his shortcoming, but that is also his endearing aspect. So I tell myself that character shortcomings are the key to attractiveness. My favorite character is definitely Tosh, because he is hot. And I have a thing for red-headed samurai dudes that really kick butt. And he sounds like this. Shinjuken! Favorite character is probably Shingara. He has an uh, interesting dialect. Hello, baby! That and Daisy Boy, Daisy Boy. Iga, he's very cool. He has really, really good tornado magic. He runs around without a shirt on in the game. So he's really cool. Deepak's <laughs> like, thank you, I know, Kona. I'm not a huge fan of the voice, but I like the character. I kind of like the vacuum cleaner salesman. I thought he was just kind of mysterious. He's a spy for the King of Nomana, and he has chosen to go undercover as a vacuum cleaner salesman because nobody wants to talk to a vacuum cleaner salesman. Because I created these characters, I don't really want to rank them. But I think that the Ark character is special. Because Ark's character is the concept we had from the very beginning, I feel that character is very special. The look of each character has a lot to do with how fans feel about them. Ryuichi Kunisue designed the characters for Ark 3. I usually try to have the appearance of the character reflect the personality. We might not receive any suggestions from the scenario writer, and in that case, I have a free hand to create what I like. And even when we receive a request from the scenario writer, I might think about it myself sometimes, and when I determine it should be some other certain way, I try to consult with the scenario writer and incorporate that idea into the character. I try to study people carefully, and I try to be very alert to people's expressions of their emotions. For Ark, the age group of the characters was younger than usual, so I watched that particular age group very carefully and created the characters with the mannerisms of that age group. This character, Alec, was supposed to be a boy who was very straightforward and with a very strong sense of righteousness. 
So I drew the character to reflect that personality, with big eyes and a certain shape of eyebrows. As for Lutz, this character is relatively lighthearted. Although internally he is strong, but on the outside he appears to be lighthearted. So I tried to create an atmosphere of character that is easy to approach and friendly. As for Theo, as you can see, he's an innocent and very childlike boy. One thing that I had in mind for him was to reflect his strong will. So I drew this character with that in mind. From the beginning, Akagawa-san's idea, the producer's idea, was to do cutting-edge RPG, to show off cutting-edge technology. And at the time Arc 1 came out, CG was just getting started. Then Arc 2 really takes CG and runs with it, and you can see you know, how they're starting to model. It was pretty spectacular for the time. And then Arc 3 comes along, and uh, that's another two years later, and you can see the evolution of the graphics as well there, where the 3D uh, CG is just really, really great. And Arc 1 and 2, you know, they primarily used CG for, you know, the flying ships and, and stuff like that, but the characters were never done in 3D. But in Arc 3, they, they incorporated more of the 3D character design. iDesign is the company that was doing the animation for Arc 3, and they were heavily involved with making 3D environments and 3D animations that were believable for the game. At the time of the release of Arc Number 2, character animations were possible, but there were a number of restrictions. For example, from the point of view involving hardware, we couldn't do the characters. But with Arc the Lad Number 3, there was an abundance of software applications available, and there were some new software programs that were suitable for character type animations. At the beginning, we didn't think about putting the characters in the CG movie segments. We created one as an experiment, and it was received so well that we decided to follow this course of inserting these characters into the movie segments. Of course, we first decide where the movie inserts will be placed, and then we create the storyboard, and then each designer starts the modeling of each character. At first, we usually have either some sort of a design sketch or a higher quality illustration of the subject. So basically, we have this basis for our layout. Then we have a meeting with our clients concerning what kind of image they want to convey. And then we create the images for the screen one at a time. This process is the same with any 3D CG process, and not just limited to game applications. In animation, the most difficult part is illustrating the movement of the hair or clothing items like a cape, that is, any soft object. We tried a variety of different tools, such as a cloth simulator that comes with certain 3D applications, but we found them to be unsatisfactory. So what we did at the end was to use a skeleton bone structure and move it by hand. We created an ocean scene by using the digital nature tool, and we also used the digital nature tool for the clouds. But it was difficult to achieve the effect. It was very difficult. For Arc the Lad 2, the part that was difficult was that there were many scenes where buildings collapsed. When we use CG, when we illustrate a standing building alone, that is easy. However, if we have to construct a scene with the building crumbling, we have to piece together each of the pieces of the building that break separately. So that was a very difficult process and required a lot of patience. There are three people who concentrated on character making. Four people worked mainly on backgrounds, and the remaining people worked on scene structure and camera operation. We have at least one staff member who draws 2D pictures using software such as Photoshop for the purpose of making texture maps to paste onto the 3D models. And while this staff person works on this aspect of the job, other staff members work on the modeling with 3D computer graphics software. They then make the basic shape that will be utilized to paste the pictures onto. Once we have made the 3D model, then the animation aspect of the job becomes very easy. Moreover, it possesses this realistic sense to it, so it is much preferred, and the end result is fantastic. For Arc the Lad 3, we spent about four months total working on it. 
The number of machines that we had at that time limited us somewhat because we did not have that many. But we utilized these machines 24 hours per day, every day. As for our staff, due to the importance of this job, there were many times when every member of our staff stayed at the office day and night. So in that manner, we worked continuously, and it took us about four months. Akio Yoshioka takes over where the animators leave off, assembling characters, backgrounds, and CG elements, adding special effects, and tweaking the results to achieve the final look. In order to express the subtle nuances and to capture the softer side of expressions, we have to use filters, and in that process we need composites and editing. I create a product by putting together a composite of the various materials provided by each designer. I'm the one who created the storyboard to start with, and I will connect each cut based on the theme of the storyboard. This is just the ideal job for me. Although I sometimes don't get that much sleep or have a lot of time to eat, overall, I feel this is a fantastic job to have. Sound effects and music add excitement to the formerly silent movies. When I do my work, there are no sounds involved. I think that I had to anticipate how the product would appear once sound was added. And then later, when I had an opportunity to look at the finished product and compare them to the soundless segments, these segments seemed just so much improved and wonderful. Andosan is the um, musician, composer. And with Akagawa-san, that's how the first game came to be a landmark in, in music because it had the uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, had a live orchestra doing the sound. And uh, that was unheard of at the time. So until that time, when people spoke of using an orchestra for a game, it was for the associated records, but it was never in the game. It was just kept for the record only. So we came up with the idea to use the orchestra for parts of the game itself. Of course, we were worried it might cost a lot of money, so I went to my boss to discuss the situation. And he responded by saying that even if it costs a lot of money, let's go ahead and do it. Therefore, we went to London to work on this. I believe I took on our collection because I had a temporary bout of insanity. Working Designs had approached Sony about producing a U.S. version of ARC-1 soon after the game was released in Japan. They asked again after the debut of ARC-2. And when ARC-3 was released, they came up with a bold idea. We approached it as doing all three games together in one exclusive box set. And when we approached it that way with uh, Sony of Japan, they were interested in talking to us and licensing the game to us. To kick off the project, two working designs programmers traveled to Tokyo in December of 1999 to meet with their counterparts at ARC Entertainment. Yeah, in Japan, they had their computers, little toys and stuff set around them just like I do. Like, I thought that was kind of neat. And then we looked around a bit, mostly in Laserdisc shops. So that's what the other programmer liked. So we went to Akihabara and walked around. Oh, the subway was really cool. Really hard to figure out your way around, though. They had like, a whole bunch of maps with lots of lines. Really confusing. You know, it was so easy to spend money there because it was all coins. So it doesn't feel like you're spending a lot of things. It's like, oh, $50 just went by. Localizing all four games turned out to be an enormous and time-consuming project. It didn't seem especially daunting until we started getting the code and the text and seeing how large of a project we'd really signed up for. Localizing the game is sort of the, the standard procedure that we have, but just on a much larger scale, which is uh, you have your regular translation, which is Japanese to English, and you take that, isolate the main story points, and uh, rewrite the game in English using the storyline so that it, it reads conversationally. We try to keep all the games released as up-to-date as possible as far as making use of the latest things that are offered for the platform um, that are in wide use. 
So we added analog, we added dual shock, um, we added the extra memory card slot so you could save more on one card. The Japanese standard, or sort of the standard in game role playing, is, is three saves per card. Well, much more than that will fit on most memory cards. So we generally try to put as many as you can possibly put on a card. So we increased arc one to 15 saves per card. Arc two went from three to seven. Arc three went up to 15 saves. Well, the interfaces for all three games were slightly different. We tried to unify most of them so that when you go from game to game, you don't really have to read it as much as just feel it. That's one of the things I hate about most games, trying to find my way around menus. The translucency was added to the boxes. So, you, so if you can see the battlefield below your screen, see what's going on, whereas before the boxes came up and you couldn't see what was underneath them anymore. You had to like cancel out so you could see what you're doing and then go back in if you forgot. In Arc 1, the movies were done in 16-bit color, and but they were originally produced at 24-bit, but they were being played back at 16-bit. So uh, our programmer, Ken, went back in there and figured out how to run the movie that 24-bit color, which allowed us to have a, a higher quality movie. So we're trying to increase the playback of the movies in Arc 2 to get rid of some of the artifacting and making them look a lot better. I think the fans in Japan would really like the improvements. I think the people in Japan would have made these improvements if they had time. I think they just probably ran out of time. So they had to release it as it was. They couldn't continue on and make more improvements, which is what we get to do. When you do localizations, you get to make improvements upon games that are already good. You don't have to start from scratch and hope you come out with a decent product. You already know you have one. Just make it better. We get a lot of artwork from Japan, and it's a lot of splicing up of images and um, being able to separate foreground from background. And we do this because um, for a package front or for a poster, you need to be able to fit the dimensions. Occasionally I'll actually do a lot of my own art, but I have to mimic the style of the Japanese art so that it looks the same. The computer is purely a tool. You draw the art and then you scan it into the computer. So I use Illustrator. In Illustrator, I pulled all of the scan drawings and that's where you do all the coloring. That's where you do any sort of editing that you need. Ark of the Lad collection is the largest anthology ever released in the United States. The end of the project is probably the most fun of Ark. <laughs> it was a monumental task and finishing it, you know, seeing the end, seeing all the stuff coming together, you know, packaging, seeing the stories get a really good critical reception. Uh, but the people were just amazed at how, how the story is and how deep it is and what you can do. Really makes us, you know, all of us glad to be involved with the game at this level. I mean, you know, we're all very tired, but, but we're glad that, you know, we did it. At least I think we're glad. Yeah, we're glad. <laughs> From the Japanese people's point of view, the way this game is going to be released in the U.S. causes us to be almost envious. And of course, maybe I don't need to say this, but I would like American players to start playing from the beginning of Arc 1. Because in Arc 1, you train your character to some extent, and then move on to the next. Japanese players did this over a space of a number of years, and American players can do this also over a shorter period of time. But if you could play each one without hurrying too much, then you would enjoy this game much more. So please enjoy playing it in that fashion. We get a lot of artwork. Blah. Yeah, they're, they're much fluid. They have a good fluid movement. Blah, blah, blah. That sounds silly. <laughs> Again. Victor's a lot of fun to work with. He knows just how to joke around and be a total goof off. I just realized I didn't brush my teeth after lunch. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I have to burp. Ah! Well, I am that. Spoiler. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Ooh. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you? Okay, wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. Excuse me. Mwah.